New Daddy, VOA1, The Hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dan Novak. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear stories from Dan Friedel and Faith Perlow. Later, Brian Lynn presents this week's technology report. We close the show with the next part of our U.S. history series. But first, here is Dan Friedel. The U.S. Space Command recently released a proposal aimed at reducing the junk orbiting the Earth in space. Space junk might be a piece of metal that broke off from an orbiting satellite, or it could be a whole satellite that is no longer powered on or controlled by the organization that launched it. If other countries and businesses agree to follow the U.S. proposal, outer space could become much safer and cleaner. Lloyd Austin is the U.S. Secretary of Defense. He approved the proposal, known as Tenets of Responsible Behavior in Space, in early March. It is not a legal document. It is a five-point list of so-called best practices. One of the points reads, Avoid operating in a way that may harmfully interfere with the function of another space object. Another is operate space objects through end-of-life disposal in ways that limit long-lived debris. The other points relate to avoiding collisions or crashes between space objects not interfering with an organization's ability to control a space device, and communicating ahead of time about a possible collision. The main concern is that there are too many old objects in space that are no longer used. Those objects may get in the way of objects that are useful. Government space agencies and private businesses are working to create some kind of order, especially in the part of space that is called low Earth orbit. That is where a number of Internet satellites launched by Elon Musk's company SpaceX are currently active. Amazon is also planning to launch satellites into that area. Jack Deasy is a vice president for the company Astroscale, which is based in Tokyo, Japan. The company is testing a debris removal device called ELSA. The device connects to space debris and pushes the objects toward Earth's atmosphere, where they will burn up. Deasy said the points included in the U.S. proposal should be adopted by the industry before something bad happens in orbit. If something is not done soon and something happens in orbit, DC said he is worried the industry will make a fast decision in answer to an accident. He said, That kind of crisis-driven thing is not always the best way of setting up long-term policies that sustain the ecosystem. So far, Astroscale has raised $376 million for its space cleaning program. While Astroscale is developing a system to remove space debris, other companies are working on creating devices 
that can capture old satellites and refuel them. The hope is that the old devices can be reactivated so they can be useful for a longer period. Another company, Newman Space of Australia, is working on a way to collect old satellites and turn them into fuel for currently active satellites. The metal can be used to power new satellites, explained Hervé Astier. He runs Newman Space. Using the metal that's already there, that's a way to move forward in terms of sustainability, he said. Newman plans to launch a test satellite, in June. I'm Dan Friedel. Viktor Mikhailov is a blacksmith, someone who creates and repairs things made of metal. He lives in the Russian-controlled city of Donetsk, in eastern Ukraine. Mikhailov uses his skills as a welder to turn metal from weapons and ammunition into beautiful representations of flowers. He calls his pieces the Flowers of War. The project began when a friend gave him a broken machine gun. Now more friends bring him similar objects such as burnt machine guns and shells from the war's front line. Inside his workplace, religious statues and pictures fill the space. Outside, he has decorated his front door and fence with his metal flowers. He also creates containers out of equipment used to launch small explosives. Mikhailov has shown his war art in a museum in Donetsk. He also keeps his art as a remembrance of the war in eastern Ukraine. Real flowers will not last long, and my roses will become a reminder for a long memory, he said. Donetsk is in the Donbass region of Ukraine. It was once a center of industry. Since April 2014, however, the area has been the center of a separatist rebellion supported by Russia. The conflict began a few weeks after Russia seized control of Ukraine's Crimean Peninsula. Russia invaded Ukraine again last year. It has since declared Donetsk and three other areas in eastern and southern Ukraine as part of Russia. The city of Bakhmut in the Donetsk region and the city of Donetsk itself has seen intense fighting. I'm Faith Perlow. Google has released a series of new artificial intelligence AI tools designed to be used with Gmail, Google Docs, and other products. Google has made the AI tools available for testing to developers and businesses before releasing them widely to the public. Google Cloud Chief Thomas Kurian announced the AI additions this week. The tools are designed to assist users in writing and organizing emails and creating business documents and presentations. The technology is part of a group of recently launched tools that demonstrate major AI development progress in recent years. The tools are built by feeding huge amounts of data into machine learning computer systems. The data trains the AI systems to develop complex skills and produce human-like results. 
The technology received wide media attention last year after a company called OpenAI launched a free writing tool called ChatGPT. That tool can quickly produce human quality written documents. Experts say such systems may bring major changes to many different industries and professions. Currently, some developers and companies are able to test Google's new tools in their development and business activities. The tools make it possible for developers to create easy, safe, and scalable applications that use Google's AI technology. Like ChatGPT, Google's AI tools are designed to create fully written documents that can be used for many different purposes. For example, an employee could enter a brief description of the kind of document they want the AI system to generate or produce. The tools could then create a full marketing email, training materials, or a business plan in a few seconds. Google said its AI tools will also be able to generate brief email descriptions in Gmail, personalize business communications, and take meeting notes for Workspace service. Workspace is a product with billions of users on free and paid accounts. Hurian told reporters during a demonstration of Google's new AI tools that he sees the system being able to provide an AI collaborator to assist human workers in real time. A video presented by Curian suggested Google aims to have its AI transform the work of marketers, lawyers, scientists, educators, and more. However, Curian said Google remains deeply committed to developing responsible AI. He noted that was why the company's current AI tools are being used by groups of trusted testers rather than widely releasing its new products. Last month, Google chief Sundar Pichai announced the company had developed a new AI-powered tool called BARD, Google said BARD is designed to provide a better online search experience. Google currently holds more than 80% of the worldwide Internet search market, the online data company Statista reports. Google's announcement about the new AI offerings is the company's latest move to compete for business by launching ChatGPT-like technology tools. Companies like Microsoft and Meta are also heavily investing in AI-related products. Earlier this year, Microsoft announced a new multi-billion dollar investment in ChatGPT creator OpenAI. And shortly after Google confirmed the development of BARD, Microsoft confirmed plans to redesign its Bing search engine and Edge web browser with a series of new AI tools. Technology experts have warned that while the new AI tools can generate human-like writings and other complex documents, the systems can also make mistakes. Last month, a factual mistake Bard made in a demonstration added to a $100 billion drop in the company's market value. Microsoft also faced public criticism after some users said the company's new AI tools used with the Bing search engine produced hostile and insulting results. I'm Brian Lynn. 
Brian Lynn joins me now to talk more about this week's technology report. Hi, Brian. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Ashley. Glad to be here. This week's report examines some new artificial intelligence tools designed for developers and businesses. Let's take a look at some words from the story that might be new to English learners. Yes, sure. First, let's consider the term collaborate. A Google official said the company's new AI tools are designed to be used as an AI collaborator to assist human workers. So the word collaborate, a verb, means to work with another person on a particular effort or project. As a noun, the term can also be used in a negative way to describe a person who cooperates with enemies during a war or people who break the law. Okay. Are there other words you would like to discuss? Sure. How about scalable? This is a word often used in reports about business. If something, say a business or product, is scalable, it means it is able to grow or be made larger. In the report, a Google representative said its new AI tools were built to be scalable. Okay. Well, thanks again for joining me today, Brian. You're welcome. Thank you, Ashley. Welcome to the Making of a Nation: American History in VOA Special English. Larry West and Morris Joyce continue the story of President Woodrow Wilson and American involvement in World War One. Nineteen eighteen was the final year of the most terrible war the world had ever known, but World War One did not end quickly or easily. The German army made a final effort to defeat the Allies. The United States had entered the conflict, and Germany wanted a victory. Before large numbers of American troops could get to Europe, Germany's effort became easier after it signed a peace treaty with the new Bolshevik government in Russia. The treaty made it possible for Germany to use all its forces against the Allies on its western border. In the end, however, Germany's plan failed. Allied troops pushed back the German attack in a series of bloody battles. The addition of American soldiers greatly increased Allied strength. The leader of American forces in Europe was General John J. Pershing. General Pershing used a weapon new to the world of war: air power. Airplanes were used first, simply as eyes in the sky. They discovered enemy positions, so ground artillery could fire at them. Then, they were used as fighter planes. They carried guns to shoot down other planes. Finally, planes were built big enough to carry bombs. General Pershing also used another new weapon of war, tanks. He put these inventions together for his battle plan against Germany. Pershing's target was the Argonne Forest. It was a tree-covered area Germany had held since 1914. The forest was protected by barbed wire, and by defensive positions built of steel and concrete. It was the strongest part of the German line. 
It also was the most important part. If Argonne fell, Germany's final lines of defense would fall. The fighting in the Argonne forest was fierce. Thousands of men died. Sometimes troops got lost because the forest was so thick with trees. But day by day, the Allies pushed the Germans back. Germany's leaders were losing hope. In September 1918, they met with German ruler Kaiser Wilhelm. The army chief reported that the war was lost. Germany had no choice, he said. It must give back all the territory it had seized and try to negotiate a peace agreement. Other officials told the Kaiser that the situation at home was bad, too. People were starving. Revolutionaries were plotting to overthrow the government. Kaiser Wilhelm agreed it might be best to seek peace now, before Germany was destroyed completely. He asked his foreign secretary to send a secret message to American President Woodrow Wilson. The message would propose immediate negotiations to end the war. President Wilson received it. He did not tell the other Allied leaders. Instead, he returned a message to Germany. Wilson asked if Germany was willing to accept the peace proposals he had offered many months earlier. Germany's chancellor answered that his government did accept the proposals. However, the events of war ended the secret exchange of messages between Germany and the United States. German submarines had increased attacks on Allied shipping. Two passenger ships were sunk. 820 persons were killed. Many were women and children. President Wilson was shocked. He told Germany there could be no peace negotiations with such an inhuman enemy. In late October 1918, Wilson sent a final message to Germany. He wanted a settlement that would make it impossible for Germany to fight again. Germany, Wilson said, must promise to withdraw its forces from all Allied territory. It also must close its weapons factories. Wilson added that the Allies would negotiate only with a government that truly represented the people of Germany, not with military rulers. The new German Chancellor was Maximilian, Prince of Baden, Prince Max received President Wilson's message. He succeeded in getting Kaiser Wilhelm to dismiss the man responsible for German military policy. But he failed to get the Kaiser himself to give up power. Not all Allied leaders supported President Wilson's plan to end World War I. They could not agree on some parts of it. Britain, for example, opposed the part about freedom of the seas. Britain said it would prevent the kind of naval blockade which had been so effective against Germany. France and Italy opposed the part about creating a new international organization. Wilson had called it a League of Nations. 
To solve these differences, Wilson sent his closest advisor to Europe to meet with Allied leaders. The discussions were long and sometimes bitter. Many of the Allies thought Wilson was being too kind to the defeated enemy. But in the end, they all agreed to accept the plan as a starting point for peace talks. By this time, in early November, the situation in Germany was growing worse. Communists and socialists were calling for a rebellion. The Navy was ordered to go to sea. Sailors refused and killed some officers. Reports told of rebellion in parts of the German army, too. The nation's leaders had no choice. They would negotiate a peace treaty. On the morning of November 8th, a German delegation went to Allied military headquarters to discuss terms. The Germans were met by the Supreme Allied Commander, Marshal Ferdinand Foch of France. Foch greeted them coldly, and he did not offer peace terms until they officially asked for a ceasefire. Germany, not the Allies, had to put down its weapons first. The Germans were shocked when they heard the terms. The list was severe. Among other things, Germany must withdraw its forces from all occupied territories. It must give up Alsace-Lorraine, a part of France it had held for almost fifty years. It must give up most of its weapons, including airplanes, submarines, and battleships and it must turn over large numbers of trucks, railroad engines, and other supplies. The German delegation said it could not sign such an agreement. Germany, it said, was not surrendering. It was only asking for a ceasefire. The delegation said it could not accept the peace terms without communicating with the government in Berlin. But the German government was falling apart. Kaiser Wilhelm had finally resigned and left the country. A new cabinet had been formed, and a new prime minister had declared a German republic. Yet the situation remained unsettled. Because of this, the German delegation negotiating with the Allies had to decide for itself. After much argument, the men agreed to the Allied terms. They signed the peace treaty. A ceasefire began a few hours later. News that the shooting had stopped set off wild celebrations throughout the world. People danced in the streets. They cheered the end of the worst war in history. There were celebrations along the battle lines, too. But these were quiet. Soldiers from both sides climbed out of long trenches dug in the ground. They met the men who, a short while earlier, had been their deadly enemy. The bloody European conflict was over. The dispute, however, was not. Another fierce battle was ready to begin. This time, the battle would be among diplomats. The fight over the peace treaty, officially ending World War I, was about to begin. And that's our program for today. To 
Join us again tomorrow to keep learning English through stories from around the world. I'm Ashley Thompson.